Set your mind, set your heart, set your affection, set your desire, set your passions on the things that are above. What does that mean? It means that we have time with the Lord. We set our mind. It's a pursuit. It's a life quest that we're reaching for in God. We have to set our minds up because our minds are undisciplined. Greetings. This is Francis Frangipan, and you're listening to In Christ's Image. Today we're going to be talking about a message concerning our, our unity, our oneness with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, I think sometimes we just settle for a religion about God instead of the reality of God. And this is not something that's a little thing, friends. We are uh, we're beloved children of God. We're called the bride of Christ. We're, we are the house of the Lord. There is, there is uh, symbolism, metaphors in the scriptures that speak of of uh, the essential oneness that we have with God, uh, that we're actually the body of Christ. I mean, how much more one can we be with our Lord? He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. This desire for oneness with his people uh, has come from God. This is not our idea, uh, but the idea that we can live without knowing oneness with God, that we can go through our day without even realizing there's something wrong if we feel cut off from the Lord, or we feel a distance in in, uh, in our relationship with Him. Well, today we're going to be invading that lie that we are cut off from God, and we're going to, I believe, draw closer to the Lord. Isn't that what you want? That's what we're about today. This message is called Bridging the Distance to God. Something is happening inside of me of the, the passion of the Lord for us as people and for us to respond back to the Lord with, with the very uh, substance of what He is reaching to us with. The Bible says we love because He first loved us. And I, and I just feel like there's, there's been a battle for a number of us in our spiritual walk where we're, we're busy and we've gotten, uh, we've kind of lost, some of us have lost touch with our time with the Lord. We've got things to do. We've got important things. We're nice people. We're good people. But the fact is, and this is the fact of Christianity, Christianity was not designed by God to be sustained apart from a living relationship with Christ. What happens is we wind up becoming empty. We wind up becoming hypocrites if we go on long enough because inside of us we don't have the virtue that we need to live out what we intend to display as being a Christian. And I believe that the Lord wants us to today that there can be a, like an altar built to God in our lives, in this service, where we reprioritize our time with the Lord, where we set up in our own hearts that we're going to not have anything else be the center of our life but Jesus. We say that. How many of you can say, Jesus is the center of my life? But we say it and we sincerely mean it. But when you look at our lives, we realize he is one of many voices and priorities and, and, uh, and that there is a war for some of us even about who will be the center of our life. Will it be concerns about our finances? Will it be concerns about our, our children, concerns about life? Will it be concerns about uh, the future? These things can crowd out our soul until they take the place and we're thinking of them and talking about them and worrying about them and the life that we're to, to have with Christ gets minimized and shrunk and he's there and we're still saved but we're not really living out of the abundance of that life and I believe the Lord wants to give us an invitation at the end of this time that will help us reconnect with our life source if you turn with me to Colossians chapter 3 please Colossians chapter 3 Paul says, if you then have been raised up with Christ, verse 1, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, 
then you also will be revealed with him in glory. He said, set your mind on the things above where Christ is. Set your mind, set your heart, set your affection, set your desire, set your passions on the things that are above. What does that mean? It means that we have time with the Lord. We set our mind. It's a pursuit. It's a life quest that we're reaching for in God. We have to set our minds up because our minds are undisciplined. Our minds will wander. Our minds are easily distracted. We are just easily distracted. You say after, you know, maybe in your heart, you're going to say, okay, I got this. I got this. I, I want my heart set. I want it set, Lord. Like Jesus said, I set my face toward Jerusalem. David said, my heart is fixed, O God. It wasn't, it wasn't going to just wander anymore. We can say that. We can come here. We can say, God, tonight before I go to bed, I'm going to spend an hour seeking the Lord. Or I'm going to give my heart to that place with God that God deserves, that I desperately need. We can say that and we can get home. And if you go to bed, say, at 10 o'clock, at 9 o'clock, You'll get tired or you'll get hungry or there'll be something on the devil vision or there'll be something to distract you and you'll lay down in bed and you'll think, oh, I forgot, I'll do it tomorrow. And you won't because you'll forget. If you forgot in one day, you'll forget completely in two days. You, there is something where we have to get aggressive to seek hard after God. There is, because I'll tell you what, there are things seeking hard after us. And the devil, I don't think, is that concerned whether... You, at this stage of your life, commit some major sin or you just get hamstrung, you just get in bondage to some minor sin or minor distraction that can keep you from your destiny. And, he can keep, and the devil keeps a lot of Christians from their destiny, not over some big thing, but over little things that accumulate and become a big thing that blocks us from our passionate search after God. And I'm talking from our point of view toward God, but his point, he sought after us. Every time Jesus speaks about going for the lost, his search for the lost, he describes that he came from heaven to earth for us. He talks about it as a good shepherd who leaves the flock of the 99 and he goes out and he looks for that lost sheep and then he brings that sheep back. He carries it back. He searched for us. He spoke about it as a woman who, a poor woman who, who lost a coin and searched through the whole house to find that valuable coin, that one coin that she, she missed. That's how he searched for us. But there's a certain point where when we're, you know, we're caught by him, we're found by him, but then there's another time where he begins to withdraw a little bit from that active contact with our, our thought life and our presence. And he says, now I want you to seek after me. I've proven that you're valuable to me, but you need to prove that I'm valuable to you. And it's a test. And the test is whether we will live with distance and not be worried about it or whether the distance will become a heartache to us. And there's a lot of Christians that have learned to live without God. And they learn to go forward into their day without the presence of God. And they learn how to look Christian without the power of God. And our Christianity was never created to be sustained by people who looked one way, but inside were another. Some of us are weary. Some of us are heavy laden. Jesus says, come to me, you that are weary and heavy laden. I personally will give you rest. You're not going to find rest anywhere else. Rest for your soul. Rest for your mind. But he says, come to me. Come to me. He says, Christ, who is our life. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed. When Christ, who is our life. Not our religion. Not even the one we visit on Sunday. As always imprisoned in this building. Not as one we love. I've got people in my life that I love. But they're not my life. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. There's people I love. I love them, but they're not my life. He says, when Christ who is our life 
is revealed. Then we're revealed with him in glory. See, his goal with us is, is that, we, that he become our very life. He spoke about the kingdom of heaven. He said, it's like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and for joy over it sold everything he had to possess that field. It became his life. Or he spoke of it as a pearl that a merchant found this one pearl of great price. And he too sold everything he had to lay hold of the pearl. And listen, unless you're going after the pearl, unless you see the treasure, you live with other things. You're not ready to sell stuff until you see what's in front of us. I'll tell you what's in front of us. It's the presence of God. You could walk with the presence of God and I don't care what battle, what struggle, what is going on in the world around you. If you've got the presence of God, you are the wealthiest person on earth. And there is no substitute for the fullness, the thickness of his presence. Where you never even think about finances. You know, Jesus never worried about finances. You know what? He never had an office. He never had a schedule. What a realm he lived in. It was time for taxes. You know how he paid his taxes? Father, how should we pay the taxes? Father says, send one of your disciples down to the lake. First fish that they catch, there will be money in its mouth. Has that ever happened to you? Why? See, when you get God, you've got everything. My wife was telling me how she was talking with somebody here a couple days ago when we were in Washington, D.C., and she said how um, they were praying in their church, down, a church down in Texas, for finances. They, and was one person said, God, the cattle on a thousand hills is yours. Could you sell a few? The next day, a rancher who had just sold several thousand head of cattle came in and said, the Lord told me that I was supposed to sell some cattle and to help pay off your church building. She asked for the Lord to sell a few cattle. See, I mean, we have a God. You have a God. Who wants to be our everything. And, and, and apart from him, we can do nothing. This is what Jesus says in John 15. He said, abide in me and let my words abide in you. And if you do that, he said, you can ask for anything and it'll be done for you. Abide in me, live in me, live in my presence. Don't go anywhere without me. Let my heart and my words be in you. You be in me. And this union of your weakness and my strength, your prayer and my answer, your need and my sufficiency, this constant union, he says, you walk around, he says, you can ask me anything, it'll be done for you. You say, but God, I've got this problem in my family, I've got this problem in my job, I've got this problem in my health, and the, and the thing becomes the center of our life. But see, when Christ is our life, he'll deal with the thing. He'll give us the thing, but he doesn't want anything to take his place. Some of us are struggling with temptation. Some of us are struggling with feelings of insignificance. Some of us are struggling with, with being overwhelmed by our weaknesses and habits that are in our life that we can't seem to break. And, we're, and we want to be good and we want to be nice and we're, we're Christians, aren't we? And, and it, this Christianity is working for everybody else, but it doesn't seem to be working for me. Now, I come to church and all these perfect people sit on either side of me. But me, I can't seem to find what the power is here. Why am I still trying to be good, but I can't seem to fulfill my own desires? And that's because your fulfillment comes from your relationship with God. And he wants you to have a deeper relationship with him. I came back, my, my wife has been, like I said, she's been with uh, Vicki Brooks and Jackie Watkins in Washington, D.C., and they were doing touring and stuff. And uh, my wife has a bird that she loves, that she's adopted. It's a conure. It's a green parrot-looking kind of a bird. And they love each other. I mean, they have just become the best of friends. And 
And I came back, you know, of course now she's gone. So while she's gone, the bird, you know, I tried to be nice, but it's still <laughs> another, another voice, it will not follow. All right. And I get close to it and I speak to it. I try to be gentle with it, you know. I'm trying to soothe it apart from putting my hand in there and making myself a sacrifice to its food lust or whatever. But it just, it's angry. It's just squawking and angry. And I, but when she has it, it has all this personality. I mean, it really does. It's amazing. And I saw, I, I saw something. I saw a part. When my wife is there with that bird, it has personality. It has affection. It has, it has a, a life that is the result of my wife's attention. And its attention in response to my wife's attention. There is a substance, a measurable substance that comes from her loving it and it loving her back. That apart from that, it's just another bird, one of a billion birds that just lives to eat and, and doesn't want to be eaten. And that's their whole existence. But apart from that relationship that she and that bird have, that relationship has it's given that bird a personality. It's given it... Uh, you know, it, it misses her and it, and, and, it, and it cries for her when she's not there. Can you believe that? It cries out for her. And as soon as she walks into the room, it's, it's calm again. And I'm saying, all that we have that makes us any different than any other human being on the face of the earth has nothing to do with us, has everything to do with Him loving us. Him giving us our significance. Him drawing out from, from our deepest well of life, drawing us out, giving us hope, giving us a reason to live that's more than just eat or be eaten, giving us a, a, a vision of something that is bigger than us to live for. And it all comes from Him. And apart from Him, we can't get into the thing called Christianity. It's not about money. It's not about owning a home. It's not about having a special car. It's not about winning a special game. It's not about any of those things. It's about Jesus. You say, well, I'm not there yet. You can make a significant step toward there this morning. You say, well, Francis, I feel cold on the inside. To be honest, Francis, I'll tell you, I feel almost like I'm, I'm on the verge of, of apostasy. I feel so separate or so distant in my heart. Maybe some of you are feeling that. And you're feeling that where you are, that if you look over your shoulder back toward the Lord, as you're drifting away in that direction, where you are, you're thinking... I could see myself in three months not being in church. I could see myself going in this direction. I could hear the Lord, He's mad at me because my heart hasn't been toward Him. I know I've been too busy. Other things have taken more precedence over my life. I know that. And your back is toward the Lord and you're just drifting quietly, slowly walking in a direction away from the presence of God. But let me tell you, this morning, you turn. I'm not even asking you to take a step. I'm asking you to turn toward Him. I'm asking you to look in your heart for what you're missing. What are you getting from the life that you're living that's shrinking in His presence of God? I'm asking you to turn toward Him. Just turn toward Him. And you'll find out that He's not condemning you. What you hear in His voice is that He says, A dimly burning wick I'll not extinguish. I want to take that little burning glow, that ember, that, that last little light that's in you. Before it flickers out, I want to blow on it. And I want it to become a blaze again. And he says, a bruised reed I will not break. Maybe your problem has been you've been hurt. Maybe life has hurt you. Maybe things have hurt you. Maybe people have hurt you. And you're carrying those hurts. Or maybe you've hurt people. It's funny how we always think that it's the people who hurt us. Maybe you've hurt people and you don't know how to cope with the things you've done wrong. I'm saying today all those excuses and all those reasons can be taken away from us. And we can have the presence of God. How many of you want more of the presence of God? How many of you are desperate for more of the presence of God? 
I believe in my own heart that if I don't have more of the presence of God, that I can't continue. And I don't want to continue. I, I don't want something else besides the living God in my life. I have to have more of God. And so I'm going to ask you now to take advantage of the grace that's being given to you this morning. The Word of God says that grace and truth are realized in Jesus. Grace and truth. Maybe what you need to do is, is just realize that the truth of God that is being presented, that in those words, if you just hear and just respond, that in your response, in your turning of your heart, that there'll be the ability to fulfill your heart's direction now. There's a story of... Um, a son who had rebelled against his father and wanted to come back, but he couldn't. He felt the journey was too far. He felt the journey was just way too far, and he couldn't, he couldn't make the way all the way back. And his father said to him, they called, and his father said, Son, just come as far as you can, and I'll meet you there. If you're thinking about, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn, I'm going to do this, Francis, but I've got so many things in my life that are wrong, then come as far as you can this morning. And God will meet you there. God will go to where you are. The issue is turning your heart and not just continuing to drift off. The issue is being desperate for more of God, that you'll come from whatever direction and go as far as you can in your pursuit of Him. Let's pray. Father, I, I ask, Lord, that, that this morning, oh God, that this morning, Father, that something of your passion for us would reach into our will, would, would like you, when you went into the temple with that scourge and, and there was all this clutter, there were all these things selling and there was all this bartering and all these these uh, people and all the chatter and all the, the debate and all the stuff that was going on and all of it was religious and all of it had to do with the temple, but none of it was you. And you went in there and you cleansed your house. And now, Lord, I ask that you would do that with us. Lord, I give you permission to do that with this temple. God, I give you permission, not that you need it, but I, I open my will to you and I ask for it, Lord, that you would go through until there is one thing I do that I'm reaching forward to lay hold of that for which you have reached toward me. That one thing that we could do today, that we could get our hearts fixed on you, Jesus. Amen.